Hi everybody, uh, welcome. So the today's talk is about let business users build their own, what could go wrong. And uh, please welcome our speaker, Mike, uh, Michael Burgery. Over to you. Hi everyone. Don't clap yet. I might have a, this might be a terrible talk. You don't know. Well, uh, okay, so the, the gist of the talk is that everything can go wrong, but uh, let me prove it to you. This is gonna be a very uh, quick talk. So I'm gonna try to skip most of it, like to, to focus on the areas that matter. We're also, also in kind of an intimate setting, so if you have a question, just raise your hand or shout out in, in the middle. I mean, we're all at the, at the end of this thing, so uh, let's make it interactive, right? Okay. Um, I, uh, I spent my last, like the last four or five years uh, focused on this area, local no code apps, figuring out what could go wrong, hackers' perspective, blue team's perspective. There's a whole bunch of research I put out there. Uh, I'd recommend, like I gave a talk at DEF CON last year, uh, which might be interesting if you're, if you're into this area, so check it out and reach out to me if you want to collaborate. Um, that's what we're going to try to do today. We're going to start with figuring out what business users are actually doing, what are they building, and why are they building it? After that, we'll try and figure out uh, what goes wrong, and I'll give you concrete examples of the things that we see go terribly wrong. And then I'm going to try to finish off with an optimistic message to send you to, uh, like, a, a how can we be better? All right. So, um, local no code. This is about, like, local no code is about empowering business users to, like, do whatever they want, to be able to, uh, to m move around without IT, without waiting for us. And, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you've all experienced this. Sometimes when you ask, when you, when you, as a business user in an enterprise, it's a pretty frustrating experience, right? You need to wait for, some, for, for people to get approval to give you uh, priority, and then you need to explain to someone what the hell you want them to build. It's, it's very difficult. And so low-code, no-code is the ability of business users to just stop waiting for us. And they're actually doing it. They're just, they're just uh, uh, building their own applications, they're not waiting around for IT or for security or for any central team. And this puts us in a rough spot because we need to make sure that we remain relevant when the most of the business applications become things that business users are, ju are just building. Now, just to convince you that this thing is actually like happening in every organization right now, this video shows just how easy it is to create those applications. Right now you can basically talk to a chat and you can explain what type of application you'd like to build. And the chat will create the right table for you on top of a database with permissions, sending it out, like you can share this later with people. When you finish the conversation with the chat, you can uh, drag and drop things to customize it. And that's it, that the, the application now is alive. And so think about what happens where every conversation with the chat GPT ends up in, with a, an app that's alive, that has credentials, that has access to things. Uh, I mean, pretty soon you lose control, right? That's what's, what's actually going on right now. And so the, the last thing I want to talk about in, uh, on, on, on this perspective, on, on kind of what business users are building, is just to convince you that this is already huge. And so in order to do that, to do that I wanted to give us some perspective. So you have a number here, five million. That's uh, according to Microsoft. That's how many .NET developers there are today, okay? How many low-code, no-code developers do you think there are on the Microsoft ecosystem alone, right now? <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's the number. So there are eight million, about eight million today. I actually went through their earning reports and kind of collected the numbers from all, all around. Uh, so this is pretty huge. When you think about the, the amount of security investment we're putting to what .NET developers are building compared to what we're uh, allocating to what business users are building, uh, I mean, we're clearly not in a good spot. Um, so now that we understand what business users are building and why are they building it, the next thing is the fun part where we get to, uh, to watch these things break. And I'm going to use uh, the OWASP uh, top 10 framework. This is a, a top 10 that's dedicated to low-code, no-code. I'm, uh, I'm one of the leaders of that, that project. We are, all, all, uh, we are more than uh, 200 security professionals around the world that are part of this group right now. Uh, we've actually had major contributions from people all around the industry. If, you, if you're interested in this space, reach out. This is, this is why I'm doing the talk, uh, so, so you'll reach out afterwards. Um, 
So the OWASP top 10 is based on two things. One is the, the entire community that's around it, and two is uh, statistics, anonymized statistics that, uh, some, that, that, that we have been, that some companies have shared about the applications that, uh, that, that, will, that are built with local no code. So far, we've seen something like a million apps. Right, this, is, this is a lot. Uh, and the, the, the reason why we're seeing so many apps, even though this is a relatively new project, I mean, a couple of years, but uh, it's because there are so many apps with local no code, right? And so we, we have a very, very wide, we cast a very wide net. Um, and so let's try, we, we're not gonna go through the top 10 one by one, uh, because that would be boring, and you also have it on, on uh, you, you have it on the OWASP page. So let me share a few concrete stories. Okay, and I want you to think, when I, when I share those stories, I'm gonna do two things. First of all, I'm going to share, like, what did the business user try to do? And then we're gonna stop, and we're gonna put on our code review, our, our, our reviewer hat, or our red team in hat, and we're gonna try and think what could go wrong with this application, okay? And this, this would be best if it's interactive, at least interactive in your head, okay? <laughs> all right, so the first thing is um, onboarding. We know that onboarding an employee into an organization in the world where, where SaaS is, is there, and I, I mean, it's difficult. So many processes, lots of them are manual. So in many cases, we, we're seeing people automate these processes. This specific, specific case is automation of a process uh, for HR. So an HR team needs to uh, pick information about, needs to collect information about new employees, um, and, and, and so let's see how this application gets built. So, and I'm specifically going to show examples from Microsoft Power Platform, which is built into Office, simply because it's so prolific within the enterprise. And so, when I, as, as, as the HR person, and you can see the little icon on the, um, on the bottom right side, that icon tells you that this is the legitimate user, the trusted user. In a second, you'll see the other icon of the, for the hacker that's kind of taking a different mindset, okay? Because I'm, I'm just gonna switch between different accounts, so this will help you, like, uh, stay synced. So, I'm gonna start by creating an app. First of all, you'll know that I'm in an environment called the default environment. This is where everybody can create applications. This is where you can be productive, all right? And I'm going to start by creating an application that's uh, a simple form. So you can see that I'm asking some information about the user, about, about people that are onboarded into my organization, their, their name, their address, their social security number, things that I need as the HR team, right? Where is this stored? So I'm going to choose uh, something called Microsoft Dataverse here to store that information for me. And Microsoft Dataverse is a cool thing. It's, it's basically um, a managed SQL Server. It's a wrapper around SQL Server that's managed for you. And it brings uh, with it a bunch of capabilities like role-based access control, uh, like logs and monitoring. That's, uh, it's actually pretty cool. Um, so this is what I'm going to use here. And now the other thing that I'm gonna do is I'm going to create an automation where every time somebody fills this form, the entire HR team gets notified. Because so, so they'll just know what happened. All right, this was the app. That's it. What could go wrong? The page is closed. Okay. 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 So let's see a couple of things. First of all, here's the, icon, the, here's the hacker icon, all right? We're logging into the application. And the first thing we'll note is that this was created in a default environment. And I told you that the default environment means everybody can create apps. So everybody can go to the database and they can just search for the table that sits behind this application and they can just view this, the, 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 the information, like in raw text, it's just there. This is a real example. Uh, these are not real social security numbers, it's uh, chat GPT generated, but, um, but it's, it's a real example we've seen with organizations, and, and just think about the tough conversation with the auditor that, that you're gonna have uh, for this thing, right? Um, and so this is, so one thing which is pretty obvious is that, well, this application is allowing, is storing data where everybody can access it. Now, we've seen this pattern is actually recurring with, with many different variants where the app itself has role-based access control. You can always, only see what belongs to you but then the underlying database is uh, available to everyone. Another, uh, another uh, way we, we typically see this is with SharePoint lists. So people would build an app on top of a SharePoint list, but, and then they share the SharePoint list with everyone, and everyone has access to everything. So that's one thing. Of course, we also saw plain text uh, uh, PII and uh, social security number, so that's bad as well. But this doesn't stop here. So think ab again about, uh, like, as a, as a user, 
I, I plug in all of my information there, and then there's this automation. Remember the automation. The thing about these automations is that by default, they log everything that goes through the automation. I'm talking about the actual data, right? Not the fact that this ran, but all of the data that was updated on this record. And so the social security number, the PII, everything is just stored there. And everyone that has access to this automation has access to this information as well. All right, so this is, uh, and in this case, it's in the entire HR, HR team, but you get the point. This, uh, this is basically leaking information to these logs where it could be shared with everyone very easily. And so there's another point here, which is about, uh, again, uh, sensitive data that's, that's been written to logs, another uh, uh, data leakage issue. All right, so this was, okay. This was the first story. I think we have, we probably have time for one more. So this, the, sec the second thing is um, one of the things that uh, we hate about working at a corporate is security controls. Right? They are really annoying. So one of the ways in which we operate with them is that we try to circumvent that. So one thing is that like reading email in, in, in Outlook uh, is not fun and reading them in, in your Gmail is fun. So people are, have tried for a long time to move their per, to corporate email to their personal email, right? And we have controls for that. We have DLP, we have solutions that sit on the email server, that's great. Here's the latest uh, innovation uh, in email exfiltration. People are using a low-code app to do two things. So with one hand, the low-code app signs in to Outlook and with the other, it signs in to Gmail. And then it copies the content. It doesn't forward any emails, so you won't find it on the, on the email server and you won't find it forwarded anywhere. I mean, good luck with trying to, to fight this thing, right? And so it's pretty obvious what's, what's happening here. Every email I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to uh, every, email, every new email to Outlook, I'm going to copy that email to Gmail. But unfortunately, uh, yeah, but, and, and the problem here is pretty obvious. Unfortunately, it doesn't end here because well, what about my, my, the emails that I had like yesterday? What about creating a full sync of all of the emails that I, that I used to have because I, I like Google searches, it's so fun. And so we've, we actually, we've actually seen people create this type of application. This is an application to sync the emails that I already have in Outlook to my Gmail account, all right? Uh, and here's how it works, it's pretty simple. I log in, I need to plug in an email address where I will send myself those emails through my Gmail account and how many emails I'd like to sync. All right, um, here's the uh, automation behind, the, behind this. So for every new uh, email, I'm going to iterate through the email and, and again, copy the content. So, and, and one other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to share this application, all right? And, and this is a pretty nice thing. I can share this application with everyone. By the way, when I say everyone, I mean everyone, right? I mean everyone in the AAD tenant that include, that include guests as well. So if you're interested in uh, what could go wrong when you do that with guests, check out my Black Hat talk tomorrow, you'll find out. Um, everything. Uh, all right, you, in order to use this application, you provide the application, you need to uh, provide the application with this access. So access to your Outlook account, access to your Gmail account. So yeah, so we just talked about uh, sharing with everyone, which is obviously bad. Um, you can share, you, you don't have to share with everyone in the group, you can just share with people, whoever you'd like. This includes your, your personal Gmail account, your personal Outlook account, whatever. Um, yeah, okay, and check out the talk. Now, one thing to note is that when, when a user logs into the app, this is how it looks like, all right? Um, and you can see that I'm logged in with the admin account at this Outlook account, at, this, uh, at Outlook, and I, I'm logged into the account, I'm going to plug in this Gmail address, I want 20 emails, and that's fine. Now remember the logging issue, right? So the hacker, the, the, the malicious user that created this application, if they go to the logs, they have access to my emails now, and they shared this with the entire org, right? So people can now use this application. It's a useful application, and it's, and it's also user, useful for the, for the malicious user here. Um, and so, again, the, the other problem that we have here is, is, of course, again, personal data that leaks into logs. Now, before I finish off with this example, um, one thing that is important here is that this screen, this screen right here, uh, this is not the typical screen you would see when you ask, when an application asks for permissions, right? You expect an OAuth consent form. You don't get an OAuth consent form because this thing is not OAuth. This, the, the way that this thing works is actually there's refresh tokens that are being 
copied and reused. Right? So this is a token that is kind of will give you all of the access to everything that this user can do. All right, and, and, and one of the ways in which this can be explored is to create a phishing application inside of the organization and kind of check out my talk at DEF CON last year. Um, okay. So, fine. So in terms of the of, of sync and productivity, these are the things that we've discovered. You can see that, again, very small applications can create a lot of, uh, a, a giant mess. Um, I don't think we have time for the last, for the, uh, yeah, we don't. Okay, I'm gonna skip, but um, there are plenty more problems that we're seeing. I mean, things like uh, injection attacks where uh, people are trusting the thing, the, people are passing information between the app and the underlying application, the underlying automation, and then you can just change that, like, very easily. Uh, we're seeing supply chain issues, so uh, lots more. Let me just skip through here. All right, so basically, we have given business users a lot of power, and we have no controls to help them make sure that they're secure. And they, of course, don't have a very high security awareness. And so, of course, things are gonna go terribly wrong, right? This is, this is, this is kind of obvious. And so, let me, let me finish by trying to offer a better solution. And actually, I think, like, the, the, the optimistic message that I do have is that some organizations have already started to take, to take ownership of this. So some AppSec teams have created low-code, no-code security programs within their AppSec program to, to bring the uh, business development under their umbrella. This is a huge challenge, and let me tell you why. Um, when you compare professional, uh, like traditional apps and low-code, no-code apps, you'll find a few things that are completely different. One is that, uh, well, the people that are building them are, are very different, and you cannot expect somebody from HR to know how to store credit cards. This, this doesn't make sense. The second thing is that there's no SDLC at all. I mean, you go to the app, you save the app, it's deployed, that's it. Yeah, forget about like uh, uh, security reviews, forget about uh, gates, this, this is not gonna work. Um, your existing controls don't apply, and that is because, mainly because of user impersonation. Most of these apps, they operate with the maker's own identity embedded within them, and then you cannot distinguish the different users of, the, of that application. So your existing controls won't help you. And the last thing is just the scale. I mean, you'll find at least 100x application, more applications that are built with this thing. Uh, you uh, everything manual is out the window. Don't think about like uh, security reviews or anything like that. It just won't work. And so let me, let, let me try to push you in a direction that I think would work. And this is based on the organizations that are actually pulling this off or, or starting to pull this off. Large corporates, mainly Fortune, Fortune 500s. So in terms of uh, awareness, it's important to even though we can't expect business users to know everything, it's important to raise awareness there. And I'm happy to say that the OS top 10 might help you. This is actually, a, a, so we've had a contribution from, from a couple of uh, amazing folks, uh, you can see written here, which basically translate the entire top 10 to plain language that business users can understand. This is a free resource. You can use this to educate your, your users, uh, and I'm hopeful this will, this will help you. Um, the second thing, in terms of the SDLC, there's a, there's a big opportunity to create a, like a standard here. You need to define what works for your environment, which use cases are fine and which are not, what, what environments people can use. If, everybody using a sing, if everybody's using a single a default environment to develop all of the apps, uh, of course we're gonna find issues, right? So we need to think about what, what we really want before we can push it in, the, in, a, in a better direction. Um, in terms of controls, even though the con existing controls don't apply, we have an amazing opportunity here because low-code, no-code is replacing uh, people that are just copying, copying and pasting files. And you've seen the level of login that these automations have. Think about the, the level of visibility we could have into what the business is doing. This, is, this can be unprecedented visibility, but we need to do the work first. And in terms of the scale, well, the only real solution for that is to fight fire with fire. Right? So we need to build, we need to use low-code, no-code, we need to use automations to find when these things can go wrong and automatically fix them. Because if we, if you, we wait for manual solutions, I don't think it will help. So with that, I think I'm at time. Thank you very much. We might have uh, time for one question, yeah, right? We can do two questions. Awesome. Anyone? 
Or just a statement, just somebody telling, telling me that I'm wrong. Very, very good. Um, do you, uh, have you encountered Zapier? Is that, does that play into your, your top 10 as well? Is yeah. Different yeah. problems? Um, the only thing that's kind of, that we see that kind of different about Zapier is the fact that uh, it's more like uh, from the grounds up, like in terms of uh, how the enterprise uses it, but the same kind of problems occur there as well. User impersonation is like the, the go-to standard. Because the problem is that if you think about like business users building applications, they can't uh, just ask for a service account, right? They don't have access to that, so they just use their own identity. There's no other way for that. So the same kind of problems. And Zapier, and the problem with Zapier, uh, on top of, of what we've seen here, is that it's a platform that's, I mean, they are trying and they are, they are becoming better, but they, are, they haven't started as an enterprise-focused company, right? And so if you look at like logs and monitoring and admin controls, they are, they are getting into a better place, but uh, st still a long way to go. I have a question about how big some of these apps get. The examples you've shown are pretty simple, like it's one database collecting one set of information. Do these get to the scale where they're connecting to multiple databases, multiple services? So we put so much power into them that they become a nuclear bomb of security issues? I, I've seen uh, applications, with, I've seen automations with uh, hundreds of steps in them. These are just the things that I can explain in a 20 minute talk. Yeah, people are being very sophisticated things with this. And by the way, I'm, I've been focused on what business users are building, but professional developers are using these too. And, and when you combine the two, you get things that are even, even more scary. Hey, more questions? Yeah, I have a question. All right, thank you, Michael. Thank you, everyone. For thank you.